Hello, and welcome to uh, part one of our digestive system pre-lab activities. And in part one, we're going to take a look at the digestive tract. Now, essentially with the digestive tract, we're looking at, uh, in essence, a tube-like organ that's going to run from the oral cavity to the anal cavity. Uh, so essentially from the mouth to the anus. Um, but it's going to be a tube structure with the food passing through uh, the center of it, passing through the lumen, being transported all the way down the length of it. But from a physiological standpoint, what's in the lumen is uh, the equivalent of being outside of the body. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that when we need to absorb materials, we need to bring in the materials that are going to be used as nutrients. They've got to pass through the epithelial lining and be brought into uh, essentially the connective tissue into the blood vessels uh, so they can be transported throughout the body. Now, if we take a look at the general wall structure of the digestive tract, again, what we're looking at is a tube-like organ, and there are going to be some layers that are going to be found within the wall consistently uh, along the length of the digestive tract, uh, but the different characteristics of these individual layers may change depending upon which organ we're looking at. Okay, so what we've got on the image on the right-hand side of the slide is an example of the wall, and so what we've got, in essence, is uh, the space here to the left-hand side, is going to be the lumen. It's going to be where the materials that are being uh, digested and absorbed are going to be passing through the inside of the digestive tract. The outside over here, we've got what would in essence be uh, the body cavity. And so this is the inside of the body over here to the right. Okay, lining the side located against the lumen, lining the side against where the materials being uh, digested and absorbed are going to be, uh, is going to be a mucosa. And so we're, again, we're going to have a biologically defined space in this region. So we're going to be lined by an epithelium. And the epithelium is going to change very dramatically as we go from organ to organ within the digestive tract. Underlying the epithelium is going to be a lamina propria, so a loose connective tissue, uh, normally with lots and lots of lymphocytes, so very basophilic staining appearance uh, in that region. And then underlying that is going to be a muscularis mucosa, so a thin layer of smooth muscle, which is going to be important because it's going to contract and help bring the uh, mucosal lining closer to uh, the materials that are being transported through the lumen of the digestive tract. Underneath that, underneath the mucosa, is going to be a submucosa, and this is going to be a dense irregular connective tissue. And it might be the location where we find the submucosal plexus between the submucosa and this next layer over here. The deeper layer is going to be the muscularis externa, and the muscularis externa is going to be characterized in most regions of the digestive tract by two layers of circular muscle. We're going to have an inner circular layer, and so we can see the smooth muscle cells wrapping circumferentially around the lumen, and then we're going to have an outer longitudinal layer, and so we're going to have this outer layer where we can see the cross sections of these uh, smooth muscle cells as they're running down along the length of the, the organ, the length of the tract. And then outside of the muscularis externa is going to be either a serosa or an adventitia. A serosa is going to be a thin connective tissue with a simple squamous epithelial lining, giving us a nice smooth surface on those organs that uh, essentially are going to be facing the peritoneal cavity, facing the, the abdominal cavity. Uh, the adventitia is going to be more of a dense connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, where the organ may be anchored retroperitoneally to uh, the back wall of the peritoneal cavity or anchored to other organs. Now, if we start taking a look at the tract, again, we're going to start at the, the mouth end. One of the first structures we're going to look at is going to be the esophagus. And so, again, the esophagus is going to be a muscular tube that is used to temporarily uh, pass the material, the food, from the pharynx to the larynx to the stomach. Uh, it's going to be lined by a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So many cell layers thick, surface cells are going to be nucleated. So we know that we're going to be lining a moist cavity, but it's going to be subject to abrasion as the food materials are moving down through the, the esophagus. It may have a scalloped lumen or folds in the mucosa when we take a look at it in histological specimens because um, it's essentially only going to expand as food materials are passing through it. So a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, underlying that we'll have some esophageal glands down here within the submucosa. These are mucus secreting glands that are going to be uh, important for helping to lubricate the epithelial lining. Let's skip the slide again. Uh, there's going to be an abrupt change uh, in the epithelia as we go from the esophagus over here to the left, this minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium 
into the stomach, so the esophageal stomach or the esophageal cardiac stomach region. Uh, it's going to go from this minimally keratinized stratified squamous to a simple columnar uh, epithelium very, very dramatically, a very abrupt change. So if we take a look at it, again, the stomach is going to be lined by a simple columnar epithelium. So simple columnar cells, especially over here along the surface, uh, are going to be secreting a mucus, uh, so a neutral mucus. And then deeper to that, we're going to have some glands, which we're going to talk about. And the glands are going to be lined by parietal cells or chief cells with scattered intraendocrine cells, hormone secreting cells, would be difficult to identify in hematoxin and eosin stained specimens. Okay, so if we take a look at these, the mucus cells look like mucus cells we've seen in other regions of the body. The parietal or eccentric cells are going to be involved with secreting hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And so they're going to be large, pale, round cells, one or two centrally placed nuclei, and a cytophilic cytoplasm. Uh, again, because they're going to be involved with uh, pumping ions, uh, pumping uh, essentially hydrochloric acid, into the lumen. And these are going to be found predominantly within the neck of the gastric glands. Deeper within the gastric glands, we're going to have the chief cells. Uh, the chief or the zymogenic cells are going to be secreting peptide, horm uh, peptide enzymes, pepsinogen and some lipase. So they're going to have this appearance of basal basophilia. Again, nucleus towards the bottom third of the cell, Lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum in the middle, uh, middle third of the cell. And then cytoplasmic granules up here at the top, which are going to be the location where these digestive enzymes are going to be stored prior to release. And these, again, chief cells are going to be found down towards the base uh, of these gastric glands. Okay, so if we take a look at the glands themselves, again, we're going to have the lumen up here to the top, these mucus secreting cells. And what we're going to see is kind of an enlarged region in these structures, and these are going to be referred to as gastric pits. And then we've got an extension of that going down into the mucosa, kind of down here into this region where it's a little bit smaller lumen, so larger lumen in the pits, smaller lumen here within the glands. Uh, so we got gastric pits, gastric glands, and then we got the submucosa underlying that. And depending upon the region of the uh, stomach we're looking at, we're going to have cardiac, fundic, or pyloric glands going along with the cardiac region of the stomach, the fundic or body of the stomach, and the pyloric region of the stomach. The cardiac glands are going to have the short pits and a short gland, so a relatively short mucosa, and predominantly mucus cells, uh, again, within uh, the pits themselves, even within the gland structure, maybe an occasional parietal cell. The fundic glands in the body of the stomach are going to have shallow pits up here to the top, mucus secreting cells in the pits. And then we're going to have relatively long glands. We're going to be looking at a relatively thick um, uh, mucosa in this region. The glands are described as having a tricolor appearance because we're going to have the pale staining of the mucus cells, the pinkish staining of the parietal cells, kind of in the neck region of these glands. And then towards the base of the glands, we're going to have kind of a bluer staining because of the presence of these chief cells. In the pyloric region of the stomach, the last region of the stomach, we're going to have relatively deep glands and relatively short pits. Uh, and this is, again, it's going to be mainly mucosis, mucus cells, uh, so pale staining appearance, rare parietal and chief cells down here uh, within the glands themselves. As we go into the small intestine, the, again, the epithelial appearance is going to change. So we've got the pits and the glands within the stomach, within the small intestine, we're going to have villi and gland-like structures. Gland-like structures are going to be called Cripsal lever coon or intestinal glands. So relatively short glands, again an extension of the epithelial lining into the lamina propria, ending above the muscularis mucosa, this pinky staining region over here. See lots of lamina propria, the um, uh, nucleated cells and the lymphocytes and the loose connective tissue in this region. And at the, the base of these Cripsal lever coon, the base of the intestinal glands, are going to be panis cells, kind of a pink staining cell that we'll look at in a couple minutes. And so we've got Cripsal lever coon, the intestinal glands, kind of going down into this region. We've got a cross-section view down here on the bottom. And then we've got villi, and the villi are going to be finger-like uh, extensions of the mucosa, and so extensions of lamina propria lined by the simple columnar epithelium extending out into the lumen, increasing the surface area for putting the cells in this area for both digestion and absorption. If we look at the regions of the stomach, the first, I'm not, the regions of the small intestine, the first region of the small intestine is going to be the duodenum. So we can see the villi up here extending into the mucosa, some of these uh, Cripsal lever coon, and then deeper to that, 
we're going to have the Brunner's glands. So underneath the mucosa, we're going to have the submucosa. And in this region, we're going to have a large region of either neutral or alkaline mucus being produced by mucus secreting glands. Uh, and again, this is going to neutralize the very acidic materials coming out of the stomach. The jejunum um, uh, in this region here, we're going to have an intermediate number of goblet cells uh, scattered in among these uh, absorptive cells. So you can see some grayish uh, goblet cells here. Uh, again, the mucosa in these uh, folds in the villi. Lots of plicae circularis, which we haven't defined in this, where we talked about in the lecture. No Brunner's glands, uh, no, no Peyer's patches, but again, in this one you can see the mucosa very clearly, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, the inner circular, the outer longitudinal, and we've got a very, very thin serosa around the outside. In the ileum, uh, numerous goblet cells lining uh, the epithelium. Uh, Peyer's patches, so lymphoid nodules down here within the submucosa. Fewer villi, the villi are going to be kind of clubbed or broad shaped. Lots and lots of goblet cells are going to be present here. Now, if we take a look at the small intestine in a little bit more detail, we know that's going to be important for both digestion and absorption of the nutrients uh, that are passing through it. So we need to have a greatly increased surface area. And we've got this occurring at the cellular level with the presence of microvilli along the surface. At the mucosal level with these villi, again, so we've got these mucosal finger-like folds extending into the lumen, laminar propria, that loose connective tissue in there, but still mucosa. Um, and then we're going to have these plicae circularis, which are in essence submucosal folds, permanent folds that are going to be extending up, increasing the area for the mucosa, and the mucosa again increasing with these villi, and then the individual cells with like a, lots of microvilli along their surface. If we move down into the large intestine, the colon, we're still going to see the crypts of Lieberkuhn. So we're still going to see these intestinal glands, uh, but we're not going to see any villi. So relatively smooth or um, a little bit of a slightly bumpy appearance, but we're not going to see the villi being present. Lots of lymphoid cells, very basophilic staining for these small lymphocytes that are going to be found within this region, both scattered lymphocytes as well as uh, nodules every once in a while, so lymph nodules. Outside in the, the muscularis externa, we're going to have what's referred to as the tinny coli. Uh, we're still going to have that inner circular layer uh, wrapping around it longitudinally, but in that outer layer, uh, that muscularis externa, we're going to have thick, uh, three thick longitudinal bands as opposed to a, a coherent layer, continuous layer all the way around it. It's going to be kind of three clusters of these uh, longitudinal smooth muscle cells. We take a look at the intestinal lining cells of the large intestine. Again, it's still going to be a simple columnar epithelium, uh, but what we're going to see is kind of scattered absorptive cells, normally towards um, the, the luminal surface, uh, irregular short microvilli along the surface because they're going to be involved with absorbing water. Uh, but then, especially as we go down into the intestinal glands, the crypts of Lieberkuhn themselves, abundant lots and lots of these goblet cells so we can uh, essentially maintain a lubricated surface to the epithelium as we're drawing the water out, as we're condensing those undigest materials and packing it into feces. And this finishes our overview of part one, where we're looking at the digestive tract proper. In part two, what we're going to look at are the glands associated with the digestive system. So hopefully uh, come back for part two, take a look at the glands, uh, as well as if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Uh, thank you.